a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Uh, let me remind you uh, that at the last event at the center this semester, we're starting on, a January, on, the 9th, on the 19th of January with a debate about COVID-19 and its modeling by uh, Jonathan, which and the debate will involve Jonathan Fuller, my colleague at uh, Pitt, and Mark Lipsich, who is an epidemiologist at Harvard, who's been very much involved in the debate about uh, COVID. And you're, uh, if invited to uh, join us for this first meeting, you can register online uh, on, the cent on the center's website in the calendar. And let me remind you, we're going to use a Zoom webinar. Most of you are attendees. If you have a question, just go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, write your name, and I will promote you to the panelist status during the Q&A so that you can directly ask uh, our uh, uh, speaker today, Carl Craver, uh, a question and neither him as uh, needs uh, be. Uh, uh, without further ado, I will let Adina introduce uh, Carl and I'm also just uh, delighted to hear Carl's talk uh, to us today. Great. Uh, so I am delighted to welcome Carl Craver to uh, be our speaker, the last speaker in the Cognitive Ontology uh, Conference. And uh, it's, I think, fitting that he is our culminating speaker. Um, he is a PhD from HPS, and so he's really one of our own. Uh, and I think in many ways he needs no introduction. He is a professor, I'm going to do it anyway though, he's a professor of philosophy and a professor in the philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology program at Washington University. His uh, areas of specialty are philosophy of science, where he has a particular concentration of interest in philosophy of cognitive science, neuroscience, and psychology. He also does philosophy of mind, history of neuroscience, and does some work in cognitive neuropsychology. He's written two books, one with uh, Lindley Darden called In Search of Mechanisms, Discoveries Across the Life Sciences, and uh, his earlier book, Explaining the Brain, uh, mechanisms and the mosaic uni unity of neuroscience has been really, really influential in shaping the way philosophers of science think about uh, explanation in the brain. And more recently, Carl's been pursuing topics in psychiatric genetics and neuropsychology. Um, I'm not going to go any more into uh, lauding him, but you'll be, uh, I think, well, we're, we're all very happy to be able to hear his talk today, which is called Remembering Epistemic and Empirical. Thank, thank you so much, Adina. And it's, it's really great to be part of this series. I've uh, participated as much as I could along the way, and I've enjoyed at least four of the talks um, and, and just been really struck by the high quality. Uh, what I want to talk about today is really one of those projects that comes up as a side project while you're working on a book. So a, a, a problem that gets stuck in your head and you can't figure out how to resolve it and you have to write something in order to get it off of your head so that you can continue with the project that you were initially engaged in. And, and because this fundamentally concerns the nature of episodic remembering, um, it's, a, it's an issue that's relevant to cognitive ontology. And so I thought that I would just sort of um, share for you why I find this uh, issue particularly perplexing and, and why I think there's been a kind of confusion that runs through the philosophical literature on remembering. Uh, it'll take me a while to get to that point, but uh, hopefully I will uh, do so before too long. I should start my timer to make sure that I'm not going over. All right. Um, the, the talk has two parts. The first part it should be familiar to those of you who've, who've paid attention to the literature on mechanisms and natural kinds, where I'll try to quickly reiterate um, some, some points that I've tried to make elsewhere in an effort to set up the problem that I've got here. The second part of the talk is really uh, much bolder and I'm much less confident about it, confident about it uh, where I'll argue for a kind of pluralistic preservationism about uh, epistemic theories of mind. Um, uh, as I, for some reason, this is not, there we go. Um, when you give a talk at your alma mater, you're reminded of all of the people who uh, trained you along the way and the people who inspired you and provided the measuring stick against which uh, you would be measures, measured and uh, for better or worse. Um, and that tendency is especially strong in people who did their, both their undergraduate and their graduate work at the University of Pittsburgh, like myself. I had uh, experience with people on what used to be both sides of the hall, on 
philosophy and in, in history and philosophy of science. And, and I've given talks at the center before that were centered on the work of various of, of the people who've been extremely influential for me, Wes Salmon and Ken Schaffner, and Peter Mockamer and Jim Bogan uh, come primarily to mind. Uh, but this time I wanted to reach back to my undergrad days and give a talk that represents the continuing influence of John Hoagland on the way that I think his books, uh, Having Thought, uh, AI, The Very Idea, and Mind Design, I think continue to shape the questions that I ask and the solutions that I will accept. Um, he has a depth that I think is often absent in naturalistic philosophy of mind. Um, and I think with, that we would benefit as a discipline from going back to some of his work and revisiting some of the issues that he addressed. Next time, I think I'll have to talk about Tamara Horowitz, but that's, a, that's another story. All right, let's begin with uh, the mechanist lament, uh, the first part of my talk. It's a lament because when you're a mechanist, um, as I am, um, uh, you might hope for your uh, mechanistic worldview to do an awful lot of heavy lifting in the philosophy of science, and it can become somewhat disappointing when you find out that its that its ability to do that heavy lifting is is more limited than you thought. The dream for the mechanist in this area is that higher level or cognitive kinds specifically can be individuated by appeal to the neural mechanisms that implement them. The cognitive kinds, as it were, cut nature, cut the world at its objective joints, and those objective joints are going to be found in the causal structure of things, a term that I borrow from Wesley Salmon. The idea is that distinct cognitive kinds have distinct mechanisms, and those distinct mechanisms are distinct either because they're causally independent of one another in some sense that Clark Lemore can specify or that Jim Woodward can specify. Um, they're not causally independent, or, or alternatively, they're not causally independent, but interact with one another only through interfaces that can be defined as narrow bandwidth channels in the way that Hoagland defined them, or as ne nearly decomposable modules in the way that Simon described them, or as choke points in a causal pathway that uh, some colleagues and I have recently um, uh, proposed. But the idea here is that cognitive kinds are objectively discoverable features of the world's causal structure. And if we just pay attention to that causal structure, it will tell us where, where the cognitive kinds are and where they are not. Uh, and in particular, looking down at the brain and trying to figure out which parts hang together and which parts do not causally hang together. And on that basis to draw dividing lines between distinct mechanisms. And I think something like that idea vaguely lies behind the practices that we have and that were enshrined in McCusick's approach to psychiatric genetics, where we lump things that have similar mechanisms and we split things that have distinct mechanisms. So burning, rusting, and breathing become one thing uh, when we accept the, uh, uh, the idea of oxygen. Um, uh, 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 schizophrenia might become many things depending on what we find about the underlying mechanisms that produce the symptoms of schizophrenia. And the dream is in many ways alive in contemporary philosophy of science in the form of the homeostatic property cluster view of natural kinds. And here I've just tried to condense um, uh, Richard Boyd's rather complex account of the homeostatic property cluster view into a few key elements. Um, on his view, natural kinds are defined by a cluster of properties that regularly co-occur together. And what makes those properties hang together in a way that goes beyond mere conventional association with one another is that there's a mechanism that explains why those properties co-occur. And he requires further that that cluster of properties should somehow figure in important causal generalizations. And uh, rather crucially in the fourth premise, he has a, an idea of, of maximal accommodation, namely that any refinement of the definition of the kind either reduces causally or inductively irrelevant distinctions or glosses over causally and inductively relevant similarities. So the idea is that we will keep trying to accommodate our kinds to the causal structure, to the mechanistic structure of the world. And when we find that our, 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 way, our taxonomy of kinds introduces causally or inductively irrelevant distinctions or glosses over causally or inductively relevant similarities, that's when we're forced to either lump or split to refine our taxonomy uh, in the face of these challenges coming from the causal structure of the world. Now, the two challenges that that view faces is that, that dream of the mechanist, and it's a dream that, uh, well, in a way, I've been battling that dream since, my, since I wrote my thesis. But, but two challenges facing that dream are to define inclusion criteria and bounding criteria. By inclusion criteria, I mean we have to ask the question, when are two mechanisms mechanisms of the same kind, and when are they mechanisms of different kinds? 
And when we try to formulate those inclusion criteria, we face immediately the problem that the world is heterogeneous, that there's considerable individual variation in cognitive mechanisms, considerable individual variation in brains. And that individual variation, uh, it can be found at all levels of organization in the, in the brain and the body and the world. Um, and, and this seems to, as I'll argue, uh, pose a problem because it violates an evidential independence constraint, which is that if you want the causal structure of the world to serve as an independent basis for cognitive ontology, then that causal structure that you're appealing to has to be independent of how you characterize the cognitive kind phenomenally. That is, if, if it turns out that our understanding of the mechanical structure of the world is dictated by our choice of cognitive phenomena, then the direction of fit is going the wrong direction. Similarly, the second challenge that we face is to identify bounding criteria. And that's to identify where one mechanism stops and another mechanism begins. What distinguishes a mechanism or a kind of mechanism from its, uh, from its environment and from its background conditions. And here we think the challenge that we face is really the fact that all of the mechanisms that occur in biology are massively causally entangled with the best rest of the body and the world. Any given mechanism is massively entangled with the world in myriad ways, and it requires some, some, some means, some epistemic tool by which we will prune off those irrelevant causal connections and keep the ones that actually matter. Here again, there's an evidential independence constraint that an independent basis for cognitive ontology must define these bounding criteria in a way that's independent of how we characterize the phenomenon. And what I'm going to do in the first part of the talk is really just show that, that, that these evidential independence constraints are not satisfied here. Uh, and it really just has to do with the, with the way that we, the way that the mechanistic structure of the world is organized conceptually. Start with inclusion and heterogeneity. So the challenge for inclusion, for, for inclusion criteria, to put it in slightly different language, is that these mechanisms tend to be multiply realizable, that the same cognitive kind can be realized by mechanisms differing one to the next in a variety of different ways. Here's a picture of a hippocampus. I think this one was drawn by uh, Ramoni Cajal or Lorenzo Deneau. Uh, yeah, Lorenzo Deneau. Um, and, um, uh, and this represents some of the neurons in the hippocampus. And, and the particular directions of their dendrites and their axons, none of those need to be identically replicated one hippocampus to the next. And in fact, none of them is replicated one, one hippocampus to the next, unless you blur out and abstract to a point where you can see them as similar to some extent. But any difference whatsoever between two mechanisms is a causal difference between them. So according, uh, satisfying V3, and if you lump those two mechanisms under the same kind, despite their causal differences, then you necessarily gloss over causal differences between them, contravening the accommodation principle in Boyd's view of kinds. But if you assign them to different kinds on the basis of such minor differences, then every me mechanism is a kind unto itself, and the concept of a kind ceases to function. And when I say that it ceases to function, I, I mean that it's no longer useful for the purposes of prediction, explanation, and control. To put the point very simply, different degrees of abstraction on this kind of mechanism yield different inclusion criteria and so different kinds. So to fulfill the mechanist dream here, we need some sort of objective basis to establish which degree of abstraction we should use for characterizing this cognitive mechanism. And of course, the problem is that finding one uniquely correct degree of abstraction is nearly impossible. So on the left here, I've represented a number of different depictions of hippocampal mechanisms that contain different amounts of detail. None of them is exactly, well, let's just assume none of them is exactly wrong. Um, they are all different. Um, and so then the question is, do we count them as one? Do we count them as many? And what in the world will tell us which of these things is the right way to carve up the hippocampus? Um, Mark Slores uh, has drawn a really nice diagram that represents some of this on the right, where you've got mechanism A and mechanism B depicted in all of their causal glory in the top there. Uh, mechanism A and mechanism B are slightly abstracted below that. We drop, by abstraction, I mean dropping of detail here. We drop some detail from the mechanism and bring them closer to one another, or we can abstract from all of that detail and really see them as involving three clusters interacting with one another along two dominant causal pathways. And in that case, we can come to see mechanism A as the same type as mechanism B, whereas in, in the top two cases, it's unclear whether we would be willing to make those 
judgments. And in fact, it seems that Boyd's accommodation criteria tells us that because there are causal, there's causal structure in the top two pictures, um, that could be manipulated for the purposes of illustrating differences between the two, we should distinguish them. There are causally relevant differences between them. So, of course, the thing that you would respond to, again, I'm not trying to be um, uh, skeptical. I, I, I just want to face up to the problem, the fact that um, when we engage in science and, and, and ontology, the scientific ontology, that, um, uh, that, these are, that science is hard. Um, and, and a natural response at this point is to say, well, in these pictures, the question is whether the differences are in fact relevant. Some of these differences might not be, might not be relevant. And when we abstract, part of what we're doing is dropping the irrelevant detail. And I think that's exactly right. But relevant differences are defined only relative to some phenomenon that we hope to explain, predict, or control. And that violates the evidential independence criteria. The appropriate degree of abstraction depends on the explanandum phenomena that we were trying to characterize in the first place and how abstractly we characterize that explanandum phenomenon at all. And as I've been lamenting for years, the idea of a relevant component is defined only relative to a phenomenon to which the components are judged to be relevant. For different characterizations of the phenomenon, you'll need one version of the hippocampus. For other characterizations of the phenomenon, you'll need a different version of the hippocampus. And those minute differences may or may not be relevant depending on which characteriz the characterization of the phenomenon you are um, uh, focused on. Indeed, I think that this kind of point has been at the heart of the mechanist response to uber reductionists from the very beginning. Part of what's wrong with the idea that we can do neuroscience exclusively at the cellular and molecular level is that at the cellular and molecular level, the brain is just blooming, buzzing confusion with things interacting, contraband moving across boundaries of all different sorts all the time and trying to find some ways to, 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 to uh, uh, decide which things should be included in a mechanism and which things should not. It's too messy for that to actually work. And what's right about the multi-level mechanistic framework for understanding the explanatory structures of neuroscience is that it makes all of this explicit. The picture on the right comes from an article of mine that was published shortly after I finished my PhD in 2001. And what that picture makes clear, or, well, just to tell you what it is, in the middle, there's some isolated function. Um, in this case, it was something like long-term potentiation, that is, tetanize a synapse and get a strengthened synapse as the output of that. Those input-output relationships then frame, focus our attention on a mechanism that lies between those inputs and outputs. That's what's represented in the conic structure below it. But if we go up, we can also think about LTP as embedded into a larger hippocampal mechanism, for example. And we can ask how long-term potentiation is organized together with other components to give rise to the phenomenon. What's right about the mechanistic approach, I think, is recognizing that these embedded interlevel relationships all shape our attend or direct our attention at certain aspects of the lower level mechanisms and push others of those into the background. And without that higher level perspective, there's nothing to, 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 to um, chunk the lower, lowest level into distinct kinds. So when I say what's wrong with Bickel, it's the idea that somehow a world understood only at the cellular and molecular level even has mechanisms in it or mechanisms that are relevant to cognition or biology. Those only come into view once we define the biological and cognitive functions that we're interested in. So the point that I'm trying to make is that on the one hand, that there's a kind of boring causal mechanistic pluralism that comes for free with this view. There are many ways of carving the causal mechanical structure of things, serving different explanatory purposes or none at all. And the mechanistic structure of the world does not contain by itself the resources required to privilege some of those carvings over infinitely many alternatives. The world does not come prepackaged into mechanisms. And it's a feature of the mechanistic worldview from the very beginning that that is true. And, and if that's right, then there's a failure of the evidential independence constraint on cognitive kinds. That when you go into the brain, you say, well, these are the mechanisms of episodic memory as distinct from semantic memory, but you're already operating tacitly in the background with a conception of what episodic memory and semantic memory are. And that's doing the work of separating these claims because that's the only way that you can make judgments of relevance. A similar thing is going to arise when we deal with the reticularity and the boundary problem. Here we're concerned with the question, where does one mechanism end and another mechanism begin? When do I have one token mechanism and when do I have two? 
And here we face the problem that the that mechanisms, as this network diagram suggests, are just massively connected with the rest of the brain. What's going on in long-term potentiation and the molecules that are involved in long-term potentiation are in fact in a stew of intracellular space, bumping off of one another, changing one another all the time. And all of that has to be carved away and abstracted away from for us to be, even begin to see LTP as a thing worthy of our attention. So if we do that by attending to mechanisms, well, the first question that we're going to face is which mechanism should we pay attention to? So if you're paying attention to, for instance, the action potential, and that's what you want to explain, even for that single explanandum phenomenon, the question is which mechanism is relevant for the purposes of deciding which, whether this is a kind or not? Should we pay attention to the membrane mechanism that's responsible for the rising and falling of the action potential? Should we pay attention to the regulatory mechanisms that continue to produce this over and over again, despite the fact that the neuron is constantly changing? Should we pay attention to regulatory mechanisms that are maintaining the osmotic balance between the inside and the outside of the cell? Should we talk about developmental or genetic causes and talk about how it is that cells come to be organized in such a way that they can produce action potentials? Should we talk about evolutionary causes and how it is that organisms came to produce um, cells that generated action potentials? And the problem that we face here is that which mechanism is relevant in a given context depends on the again on the phenomenon that we're trying to explain. We appeal to these different mechanisms to explain different things. And if that's the case, this again fails the independence condition. Notice that we neglect most of the world's causal structure in our explanations. We neglect in the hippocampus that there are in fact mechanical effects of one cell on the next, or that there's heat transfer going on here, or that there's metabolic commerce going on, or that there are gravitational effects. And the question that I'm asking here is what guides this filtration of the causal structure into its relevant mechanistic causal structure? Here's just another visual picture of the problem. Things are rather in, intimately connected with everything and, 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 and doing science at higher levels requires abstracting from that mess. And the question is, what's the principle for that abstraction? But the mess itself doesn't contain the resources for that abstractive move. Again, it seems like what we appeal to is the idea of relevance. A part is a component if and only if it's relevant to the phenomenon or to the behavior of the mechanism as a whole. What makes something part of the mechanism as opposed to not part of the mechanism is that it's relevant to the behavior that the mechanism is called upon to explain. That's in the mutual manipulability criterion of interlevel relevance. Um, uh, and and um, it explains what's, what we've, we in the mechanisms literature have come to call Glennon's law, which is just a truism that there are no mechanisms simpliciter. There are only mechanisms for a given phenomenon. And that's just a an easy way of saying that the complex causal structure of the world is not carved up in this way, that the boundaries of mechanisms are drawn by relevance relations. So again, the direction of fit seems to be reversed. The causal structure of the world is reticulate with myriad causal entanglements, and only some of those are relevant to the phenomenon, and only some of the causally relevant ones are in fact interesting and worth paying attention to, and the relevant and interesting ones are relevant and interesting only relative to the phenomenon that we seek to explain, and again that seems to violate the evidential independence require, requirement. Mechanistic componency is defined in terms of and so presupposes the phenomenal kind and is not independent of it. So the general point that I'm trying to get at in the first part of this talk, and I seem to be on time, uh, is that in both of these cases, both for inclusion criteria and for bounding criteria, the description of the higher level kind defines the boundaries around and the inclusion criteria for the lower level mechanisms. And that seems to be opposite the direction of fit that one expects if one thinks that the causal structure of the world contains within it the resources required to do the taxonomy at higher levels. It, it appears that way, but only because we've already um, uh, done much of that fil re relevance filtration before we even begin to ask our experimental questions. Now, in a way, this isn't saying anything that Patty Churchland didn't say a long time ago, though she has been really quite insistent on the importance of neuroscience for reshaping the way that we think about the mind, and I'll get to that in just a second. Another strand in her work was to really emphasize the way that things at different levels have to co-evolve, that our understanding of the higher level kinds shapes our understanding of the lower level mechanisms, which as we continue to discover, forces us to revise our understanding of the higher level mechanisms. 
And in some respects, you can see the effort to understand multi-level mechanisms in my work and in the work of Bill Bechtel as an effort to really flesh out this co-evolutionary story of the sort that Pat Churchland uh, said we should really be aiming at in the cognitive neurosciences. And in fact, this mechanistic, these, these multi-level pictures that I drew were designed to do, whether that I drew and that my wife Pamela uh, helped me to make better, um, uh, are uh, uh, in, uh, in fact attempts to illustrate just what's going on in this co-evolutionary process. But notice that in the typical Churchland story, the behaviors of organisms are related to intervening mechanisms that explain how inputs of the relevant sort leads to outputs that we care about. So in this case, you've got some higher level mechanism, S is sighing, which might be a mouse navigating a Morris water maze. And it's gonna be, we're going to drop the, the, the mouse into the maze and we're gonna describe the stimulus conditions that it's got. And then it's going to find the hidden platform under the water and for it to get from one place to the other, we imagine that there are intervening mechanisms that are involved and we're going to characterize what gets us from that behavioral, from that sensory input to a behavioral output. And that, that framing in terms of sensory input to behavioral in, uh, output is tailor-made for a mechanistic story about what's going on in between. But part of what I want to point out is that when we get to this top level of the mechanisms diagram, there are ambiguities that arise and it's important to guard against them. Um, in fact, this picture that I've just been describing is the backdrop of a really complex reductionist stories like Ken Schaffner's, where he allows that these, these different levels might have to be jiggled and, and tweaked in order to bring them into alignment with one another so that they actually fit together so that reduction of some sort can go through. And it's the failure of all of that that drives a limitativist views. That is, when no amount of tweaking the higher level can bring it into alignment with the lower level, the thought is there's something wrong with the higher level kind. It has to be dispensed with as a result of that. And so the, you know, the main thrust of the eliminativist argument for many years was that the brain is unlikely, unlikely to be structured around our folk psycho psychology. And this is for a variety of different reasons, because it's so reticular, because neuroscience doesn't seem to be discovering belief boxes and desire boxes. It's also because of various uh, how vice how vice-ish themes, um, uh, namely that the brain wasn't really, it hasn't evolved for thinking, it evolved for metabolism and, and regulation of various bodily systems, and thinking is a kind of uh, layer on top of all of that uh, that presupposes that all of that's going on underneath it. So the brain is likely to be organized in ways that befuddle our ordinary folk psychology. And for that reason, it's unlikely that we're going to find underlying mechanisms that correspond to the taxonomy of our folk psychology. It's unlikely that we're going to get even bumpy reductions. And that's what pushes Pat and Paul in the direction of an extreme form of eliminativism. Those, that taxonomy is simply illegitimate in their picture. And that judgment rests on this kind of structure, the idea that all of these things are supposed to fit with one another. And if they don't fit, that suggests that something is wrong with the ontology. But suppose the Churchlands are right about how the behavioral level relates to the mechanisms responsible for those behaviors and that folk psychology is a poor guide to neural mechanisms. But suppose that they're wrong to think that our ordinary concepts of mind are thereby rendered obsolete. Uh, I've already said what I wanna say about how Isis themes, and I think I'll skip that picture. Um, perhaps we need neither blind ourselves to person, person level epistemology, epistemological orientations to the mind, nor abandon science in a synoptic vision that links together the space of reasons and the space of causes. So the space of reasons, as I'm thinking of it, following this Salarzian theme, is, uh, involves persons understood as things that reason and infer and make decisions and deliberate and commit and reflect and choose and decide and know and believe. And the space of ca causes is a thing that includes human beings understood as assemblages of dissociable causal capacities and mechanisms episodic memory, working memory, color vision, motion detection, pattern separation. And then for Sellers, the, the, the main task of philosophy was to bring these two things into some kind of synoptic vision. 
And according to the reductionist and the eliminativist, that synoptic vision will involve aligning these levels and then showing how they are connected with one another, or on failure of that, abandoning the higher level and replacing it with a higher level that better fits. But what I want to suggest is that we might interpose a layer of slack between the ontology required for the multi-level re reductive project of cognitive neuroscience and the ontology required to understand persons as epistemic agents trafficking in reasons. If that's true, the failure of reductive alignment doesn't warrant a limitativism. The ontologies aren't in competition, but are developed to answer different kinds of questions. And that's the basis of the kind of pluralistic preservationism that I'm gonna explore for the next five minutes. Um, uh, and, and it's a pluralistic preservationism that's specifically about the space of reasons as a viable perspective on the mind. That pluralism might be justified by these Halweisish themes, namely that you can come at the brain from many different directions, that thinking is only one of the things that brains do. You might come at the brain asking, how does it handle metabolism? Or how does it handle body homeostasis? Or how does it function immunologically? Or how do we, how do we treat schizophrenia? Or how does the thing develop? And there's no reason to suspect a priori that the ontologies appropriate for one of these orientations will be the ontologies appropriate for the other orientations. And pluralism is a natural and unsurprising consequence of the mechanistic approach to, approach to understanding the brain, because for different phenomena, we will require different mechanisms. And now this picture does make some sense, perhaps, that when we come at the brain, that these, these anatomical diagrams that you find in anatomy books, where you've got transparent, where you used to find in anatomy books, um, uh, where you've got transparent pages laid over the same body, um, and those different pages abstract away from the detail in the body in different ways to reveal different underlying mechanisms that often overlap in the same parts. Those different pages are representing different uh, orientations towards what the body is doing, and, and certain parts will fall into the foreground and the background depending on those orientations. And I want to suggest that the space of reasons is a, is a, is a preservable orientation. So part two, pluralistic preservationism. We don't have to be a limited to this about our epistemic ontology simply because the brain doesn't work that way. And here I want to use an example from my work on remembering because I was writing a book about episodic memory and I still really can't even tell you what it is. And I'm troubled by that. And part of the complexity is that it is many things at once. And it's not clear that we that one ontology will do all of that work. So there are four subparts to this. I'm going to begin with an analogy it's designed to get you to, to recognize that it's, that it's not ridiculous to imagine that there's a layer of slack between our highest, most mechanistic level and our understanding of the epistemology of the mind. Then I'm going to use the example of remembering and me episodic memory in particular to distinguish two different ways of thinking about remembering, an epistemic way of thinking about it and an empirical way of thinking about it. And then I'll return at the very end to think about how these two things might be brought into a kind of stereoscopic um, uh, uh, unified view while keeping them distinct. So the example is remembering here are some petite Madeleines because you have to mention those if you give a talk about memory. And uh, again, the problem for me arose by asking what is it to remember? And specifically is remembering factive and how is memory related to imagining? And in contemporary philosophy of memory, there's really a, a heated debate between people who think that memory just is imagining, that those two things are what they call continuous with one another. And then there are other people who say that these are entirely distinct things. The reasons for this conflict, um, uh, apparent conflict, uh, will become clearer in just a second. So the appearance of conflict is that on the one hand, you've got like an, an empirical notion of remembering that many people are operating with, many scientists. And for them, remembering is a causal capacity. It has inputs and outputs. It has, it's a capacity that's nearly dissociable from otherwise or otherwise separable from other cognitive capacities. And it's picked out as such precisely because it's thought to frame a single coherent mechanistic explanation at the lower level. It's characterized in terms of its inputs, its outputs, its failure conditions. And in general, people who emphasize this way of thinking about memory suggest that it's constructive and so non-veridical. I'm going to go through this again in just a second. Epistemic remembering, on the other hand, is an epistemic achievement or a success when you actually remember something. It's likely not nearly dissociable from other cognitive capacities. 
It's likely produced by many distinct mechanisms and it's characterized in terms of its inferential commitments. And most importantly, it's not necessarily veridical. Not surprisingly, people have come to think that these two ways of talking about remembering are in conflict with one another. And that the people who embrace empirical remembering think that the people who embrace epistemic remembering are just blind to the obvious facts about memory. And the people who embrace epistemic remembering and, and aren't all that interested in empirical remembering think that the people who are involved in empirical remembering just don't really understand how minds work. And those two groups, on two different sides of the hallway might not talk to one another in part because they have very different understandings about the way that the mind operates. So here's an analogy that I'm, gonna, I'm loosely borrowing from Hoagland here on normative and empirical theories of castling in chess. And, and then we'll get back to memory in just a second. What is castling? Well, you can answer that question normatively. You can say, well, when does one castle correctly? In that case, castling is defined by the rules of chess and those rules will specify the conditions under which you can castle, like a king can't have moved and you can't castle through check and there can't be anything between the king and the rook. And in fact, if you castle incorrectly, it's in, in a way, the idea of castling incorrectly is an oxymoron. To castle incorrectly is not to castle at all. In fact, it's not even to be playing chess anymore. It's, it might be playing some near neighbor to chess, but you're ceasing to play chess entirely if you've adopted rules that are outside the rules of chess. On the other hand, and nobody does this, but, but, but one might approach castling the way an empiricist would. And the chess empirist is, go is going to say something like, castling is a family of more or less similar moves made under more or less similar conditions at more or less similar times of the game. And it's going to include normative castling and variants that fail to fit the norm. So we might have creative castling um, uh, that people do while they're learning chess. Or if you go around to Starbucks and you interview people about what castling is, you're gonna get a smear of answers about castling. If you, if you, you step into games being played in public and you just watch how people castle, yeah, mostly people are gonna, you're gonna, you know, around the norm, the norm is gonna be normative castling, but there's gonna be a lot of slop in the game besides. You can study conditions under which castling takes various forms. You can study the attentional effects of, on, on the forms of castling, et cetera. But nobody would think that normative castling was reducible, reducible to empirical castling. And that's for the simple reason that the, that the epistemic or the normative theory of castling um, uh, is a story about what, how it ought to go or how it goes when it goes correctly. And the story, story about empirical castling is a story about how it in fact goes. So as an argument sketch, we might point out that normative castling is defined in terms of the rules of chess and the rules of chess are not included in or derivable from the empirical regularities of empirical chess. Those are just how people in fact move board pieces when they're sitting with chess pieces in front of them. So empirical chess can't account for normative castling. Empirical chess treats normative and non-normative moves as equivalent to one another to study them as a unit. And no theory that treats normative and non-normative moves as equivalent includes or entails the rules of chess. There's an obvious causal dependence between these two things. Obviously you can't normatively castle unless you can empirically castle it. Our capacity to engage in empirically castling makes it possible for us to be the kind of thing that can normatively castle. And normative castling might be produced by any number of empirical castling mechanisms. We could use the left hand, the right hand, as Hoagland pointed out, helicopters could be moved from one position to another on a giant chessboard. Um, uh, the medium seems to be largely irrelevant here. That's, that's uh, uh, the chess case. Now let's try to apply this to the case of remembering. And, here in the naturalized philosophy of mind, there have been any number of people who beat up on a, um, uh, what they perceive as a very simple-minded view in philosophy, that, that memory is necessarily veridical, it seems to be, be called out for particular uh, scorn. That view has in fact been embraced by huge numbers of philosophers, um, uh, historically and in the present. Reed says that memory and the common acceptation of the word is an immediate knowledge of something past. Malcolm says it's logically impossible that one should remember having seen X unless one saw it. Adi says that if you remember that we met, then you know that we met. 
And in fact, Martin and Deutscher's causal account of memory contains a normative epistemic component as well. You have to have been at the scene, you have to correctly recall that scene. And I think we might express all of this by saying that when you remember, it's, it's a bit like, oh, the word Trump used to stand for winning. Um, uh, it used to be a thing that we used to describe something that beat the competitors. Um, uh, and so I've used it here. I hope it doesn't cause confusion. Um, remembering as an epistemic trump card. Uh, the idea is that when you say uh, that you remember something, that you're claiming a particular kind of epistemic privilege um, uh, with respect to that something that you remember. It's assertoric in a way. When you say, I remember fying, you're saying, I remember it in a way I, I didn't imagine it. I didn't hear it secondhand. I remember it. And I assertorically remember that event only if I experience that event. And because of my experience of that event, I'm in a position to assert my privileged epistemic authority about it. Now, when we think about remembering in that way, in that rather thick and epistemic sense, it's defined by a whole range of commitments that are untake, undertaken when we remember an event E. The commit, when I say I remember something, I'm committing myself to the idea that, it occur, that the event occurred, that I was in this strong assertoric sense. I'm, I'm asserting that the event occurred, that I was there, that I was in a position to witness it in the relevant ways, that I was physically oriented in the right way, that I had, that my sensory systems were working, that I wasn't, that I was in a psychological state of mind to record the memories in the right way. And furthermore, that my current beliefs about that event arise from the witnessing and do so in a way that does not distort or embellishing them, like memory distortion or a bump on the head or cueing effects of the sort that Loftus studies. What I'm trying to point out is that epistemic remembering, remembering the way that we talk about it every day is incredibly cognitively complex involving all of these person level entanglements. A general feature of these epistemic uses, however, is that they define remembering in terms of norms of correctness. When does one correctly count as having remembered something? When has one correctly preserved one beliefs? When does one correctly assert the epistemic privilege distinctive of preserved firsthand knowledge? Epistemic remembering is like normative castling in this respect. It defines success in the preservation of firsthand authority, and it plausibly grounds the value of a certain sort of witnessing. Uh, uh, we, it grounds the value because memory, memory um, uh, underlies the truth of the, the justification for the claim that the witness makes. We might also approach remembering from an empirical perspective, the way that somebody in a psychology department or a neuroscience department might. And there the aim is to characterize the regular behavior of a memory system. The empirical theory will characterize the general truths about that system, the causal regularities, the input conditions, features of the output conditions, modulating conditions, failure conditions, illusions of memory, biases of memory. And by cataloging all of those, we limb the concept, the empirical concept of remembering. And in fact, the tasks that we use are ways of assaying remembrance and characterizing its generalizations, causal or otherwise. And in characterizing it that way, we're making it so that it's suitable for reduction. Again, we're characterizing the inputs, we're characterizing the outputs, and we're looking for the causal structure that lies between them. Like I said, I still don't really know what episodic memory is, uh, episodic remembering is, but a standard definition is experiential representations of past personal events, accompanied by awareness that you previously experienced the event in question, the ability to transport oneself mentally in time is associated with it. Now, episodic memory, as Endel Talving described it, uh, and as other people run with it, um, it's a memory system that constructs events, or scenes, so we need a scene construction mechanism. It's somehow centered on scenes involving the self, things that you experienced. Those scenes tend to be experientially rich and full of perceptual detail. They tend to be emotionally laden and full of emotional, they're hot rather than cold. And they tend to be organized spatially uh, and temporally. These features are supposed to distinguish episodic memory from semantic memory and other forms of memory. But in addition to characterizing those positive features, we can characterize it in terms of negative features. It's prone to characteristic forms of errors, like distortions in encoding, or distortions in storage, or in retrieval. It's prone to patterns of forgetting, like the recency and the primacy effect. It's disrupted by damage to the hippocampus and the mammillary bodies and the fornix. 
It's disrupted by anti-memetic drugs and alcohol poisoning. And in characterizing all of those pluses and minuses, we're putting contours on that empirical phenomenon. Importantly, though, the empirical capacity is not veridical. Inside, this machine is, is claimed to be just a, a representer of the past, irrespective of whether it gets it correct. So Dave Regard, for example, says most of the time when you recall what you recall accurately depicts witnessed events, but sometimes it does not. In both cases, however, the system is doing the same thing, what it's supposed to do. Sutton and Windhorst claim that veridical memories are no less constructed than false memories, putting those two things into an overarching category. And Robbins points out that constructivists about the mind collapse the processing distinction between memory errors and successful remembering. And of course, people who approach memory from the empirical perspective will trot out a million kind of illusions that memory is susceptible to. So Roddy, the Rodiger McDermott Deese task shows that people can be tugged in the direction of lures that didn't appear on an initial list of learned words. Or we can talk about the influence of schemas on remembering in the way that Bartlett did or relatedness effects, or the effects of misleading information at recall, or reality monitoring effects of the sort that Anderson study, you know, did I really do it or did I only imagine doing it? And, and can, I, can I tweak people so that they move one way or the other on that? Or fluency misattributions, how uh, if I can generate a scene, especially fluidly, I'm more likely to think that it actually happened. From the empirical perspective, and I'm not complaining about this at all, this is the way that it ought to be, failures are absolutely crucial clues for how the system works, just in the way that visual illusions are absolutely crucial clues for the way that the visual system works. Empirical remembering for these guys, though, is fundamentally constructive. Memory is not a storehouse, a vault, a videotape, a computer. It is certainly not factive. As Sarah Robbins points out, they collapse the distinction between the factive and the non-factive. Memory is not for, in their hands, recovering the past, but for guiding adapted future-oriented behavior. Um, their mental scenes constructed in the present in response to current needs. Now, if we go back to the chess analogy, what I'm trying to do is to suggest that, that normative chess and, empiric, and, and, and uh, epistemic remembering are on a par with one another. So just as normative castling is articulated in terms of the rules of the game of chess, normative and epistemic remembering is articulated in terms of the epi somewhat inchoate epistemic rules for properly asserting the authority to speak about non-occurrent events. Normative castling with your bishop is an oxymoron. And from this epistemic perspective, non-veridical remembering is also an oxymoron. There's no reason to think that these two things are reducible or that normative remembering should be reducible to, to uh, uh, empirical remembering. The epistemic theory is a theory about competence after all, a theory about correct performance. And the empirical theory is a theory about actual performance, a theory about how we go about the task. They shouldn't be reducible to one another because epistemic remembering is defined in terms of success conditions. And success conditions are not included in or derivable from the laws of empirical memory. Remember, the laws of empirical memory treat non-normative and normative remembering as equivalent to one another. And no theory that treats normative and non-normative remembering as equivalent to one another includes or entails the epistemic rules of remembering. So empirical remembering cannot account for the defining feature of normative remembering, namely that it puts us in contact with what happened in the past. To try to combine these two things would be to engage in a sort of category mistake, putting an ought together with an is, deriving something from something which has no basis from which to derive it. But at the same time, I want to argue that against the church lens that that doesn't mean that, that, that epistemic remembering ought to be eliminated for this reason. They're not in competition with one another, and so they're not called upon to do the same thing and shouldn't be seen as somehow at war with one another. And the two things that I want to say about this, on the one hand, there's just a purely kind of functionalist consideration, which is that these cases of epistemic remembering, playing a witness trump card with respect to some past event, functions as a success condition in a system of knowing independently of whether it corresponds to a unitary cognitive mechanism or not. The taxonomy for our epistemology need not match the taxonomy for our mechanistic science. The test, secondly, the tests for empirical memory presuppose epistemic remembering. Notice that we evaluate episodic memory, that is the empirical notion, 
by measuring success. We ask, for example, how many of the details you got right or how many things you correctly remembered were on the original list. Or we measure the rate at which you forget those things. Or we, we, we try to ask whether you got the details right or wrong as a way of telling the distinction between memory and imagination or remembering versus knowing. Systems are memory systems in virtue of contributing to our ability to satisfy those epistemic demands. But now to return to the Madeline, hopefully this time to say something slightly different than what we normally say when we get to Proust at this moment, epistemic remembering is multi-mechanistic. It's typically underwritten by many distinct cognitive operations in a single instance. So even if you look at the way that Proust describes this phenomenon, it is not the way that the empirical scientist describes it. He says he tastes the Madeleine and it immediately produces a shudder in him. And then he remembers that he was with his aunt on that day, and that is a kind of event memory. But then he knows that it must have been a Sunday morning because his memory contains church bells and church happens on Sunday mornings. And then he says that he remembers the church bells in the distance of the town, which means that he's storing the layout of the town at somewhere, in some ways. And then he says that he has this explosion of tastes and visual scenes from his past, but those are going to be perceptual memories of some sort. And he's also filled with a sense of love and being loved by his grandmother at this moment. And that's a kind of emotional memory. So, so, so when Proust is doing this kind of person level remembering, he's in fact not calling on a unitary cognitive phenomenon at all. He's calling on a melange of many different kinds of cognitive phenomena that have to, to be operating together and at once for us to have this, this important experience to him of remembering uh, this, these facts about his past and his relationship with his grandmother. It's much broader, in other words, than scene construction, which is the way that we often characterize the, uh, 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 the empirical conception. It's defined in part by the commitments that we undertake when we say or think that we remember an event. We're committed to the idea that the event occurred, that we were there, that we were in a position to witness it that our beliefs didn't arise from somewhere else. And again, note that these are very cognitively complex entanglements and in fact seem to involve almost the entire cognitive apparatus, self-knowledge, knowledge of past, knowledge of time, knowledge of space, all of those things go into our epistemic remembering. So, so what I wanna to get to is the idea that this picture that I've been drawing for a long time with the help of my wife, Pamela, um, is in fact, in some ways misleading. It treats the top rung as just another mechanistic level rather than a shift from performance to competence. And it neglects the multi-mechanistic realization of epistemic memory. It neglects the personal level and the normative entanglements that are constitutive of epistemic remembrance. Now, that said, normative remembering clearly depends mechanistically on empirical remembering. Epistemic remembering is a subset of empirical rememberings. Um, our capacity to engage in empirical remembering makes it possible for us to engage in epistemic remembering. But the reduction of epistemic remembering to empirical remembering would involve a category mistake. Empirical remembering is conceptually derived from epistemic remembering as well, so it's not eliminable. To study remembering empirically, we have to fix a domain of phenomenon that will count as remembering. And that involves all of these tests that are normed by whether you get the phenomenon right. So towards an ecumenical stance here, the empirical theory characterizes a system in virtue of which were the kinds of creatures that can privilege knowledge gained by first person experience. Our understanding of, epi of, of epistemic remembering is part of a system, a, a normative system uh, of regulating truth telling about the past, causal remembering makes it possible for us to be the kind of thing that could possibly be a truth teller. But what makes an empirical memory system a memory system is that it occasionally satisfies the normative demands. Our cognitive ontology is defined in part by the epistemic games that we play. So what I really want to get to at the end of all of this is the idea, just to, to wrap up, is to say that the lower level mechanisms in these multi-level pictures conceptually depend upon the framing of the higher level phenomena that we're trying to explain. And how we carve the world into mechanisms depends on what we're trying to explain. And those will define the inclusion criteria and the bounding criteria. And I think that any project in cognitive ontology needs to own up to the fact that the causal structure of the world does not contain on its own an independent basis for establishing those criteria. But when we look up 
to try to see how some phenomenon is situated in, in, in the lives of an organism, we find an ambiguity. We can look up and find a link to a behavioral capacity like empirical remembering, or we can look up and find a link to an epistemic capacity like epistemic remembering. And when we do that, when we, because we can have that ambiguous way of looking up, on the one hand, we can generate false conflicts as if these two things are in opposition to one another, witness the contemporary literature on the philosophy of memory. And we obscure, I think, the complexity of bringing the space of reasons and the space of causes into a kind of, the kind of alignment that would be required to have a proper synaptic view. And just to, to say one last thing about that, I don't think we should find a single cognitive faculty that corresponds to our epistemic notion of remembering. We should seek a multi-mechanistic explanation with different aspects contributing different things to our, episode, our epistemic remembering. How do we learn what it means to remember? How do we acquire the norms of correct truth-telling and remembering? How are those linguistic norms internalized? How do we construct the idea of the self and locate it in time? We need to look outward from this empirical phenomenon into the rest of the cognitive system and to the world to understand how that happens. And then when we return to looking inward, we'll be looking for very different things. And what I've done with memory here, just to say one line at the end, uh, is I think uh, could be done and in some cases has been done for any number of words that are used to describe our mental lives that also have this double life seeing, hearing, believing, knowing, inferring, supposing, forgiving, etc., all have these corresponding epistemic and empirical notions. And I think it's very important, especially for philosophers, to recognize that when we leap from the empirical to the epistemic, that's not merely a mechanistic link leap, but a very a leap to a different kind of perspective on the system. All right, um, so I'm gonna end there. I wanna say thanks to uh, Sarah Robbins, Eric Marcus, Andrea Santana, uh, Chloe Wall, Stan Klein, and John Cosmides for comments on an earlier version of this, and, uh, and uh, John Hoagland for um, uh, really sending me down uh, any of these paths in the first place. So, thank you. All right, thanks, uh, Carl, for this amazing talk. I'm sure we will have a lot to, uh, to discuss. Um, and there's only a few people uh, are lined up. So, uh, Paul, uh, please, uh, uh, um, uh, get us started, and I would propose uh, the other one. Hi. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for that talk. I, I must admit, it was a bit over my head. I'm not a philosopher, but a neuroscientist. Um, um, it, and I, I actually have a have a comment um, rather than a question, but I, I would really like to hear your response. And uh, <clears throat> and that is that. Um, I, I think I agree that our um, ontology need not necessarily match the brain mechanism. Um, but I do think we want to have a mapping uh, between the pieces that are there in the brain and the pieces that refer to things like, that explain the things we care about, about things like, like memory or um, other mental uh, phenomena. Um, but I think to me, it seems like we, we have a, uh, we have a I think it's useful to ask a question regarding constructing such a mapping. Is the question is how does nature build distinctions? Where do the distinctions that actually exist come from in nature? There's is that we know where, where, where those distinctions come from. They come from evolution. They come from the process that evolution um, follows as it constructs the creatures that we are. And we have a lot of information about that, which to me seems is um, remarkably ignored um, in, in cognitive neuroscience. So distinctions come from um, modifications of developmental processes that um, can be reconstructed by doing comparative um, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, et cetera, um, creating a, um, essentially a, a sort of a history of the stages within which simple animals gradually differentiated their original mechanisms into more sophisticated mechanisms, some of, some of which 
address some capacities, some of which address other capacities. And given that we have all that information, seems to me that that really should be the basis for defining the pieces, at least at the mechanistic level. And the example that I would give here is um, regarding memory, because you, you, you spoke so much about memory, in particular episodic memory. Um, and, and of course, there's good reason to, to assume, for example, that memory is something, episodic memory is something that involves the hippocampus. Well, if we know that, and if we look at the evolution of the hippocampus, that tells us some very, I think, very informative information, very useful information for, for understanding some of the phenomena. And in particular, to me, the kinds of question that is never asked, at least not that I, to my knowledge, but I think should be asked, is this form of question. It is clear that the hippocampus and its, and its um, sort of ancestr ancestry in the medial pallium of vertebrates was primarily a navigation system, primarily for um, uh, you know, initially navigating around the world, finding food and shelter, et cetera, eventually building some kind of a knowledge or a cognitive map, but very much about space, very much about relatively low dimensional, uh, you know, two and a little bit dimensional space for terrestrial animals. And yet somehow that thing has been exapted to um, underlie a major aspect of our episodic memory. And that I think already gives us some clues about, okay, well, if a navigation system um, ev evolved and elaborated into something that we can use for episodic memory, that tells us something about episodic memory that I think shouldn't be ignored because it, it creates constraints. It might explain some of the failures of episodic memory. Why are some things easier to remember than others? Why are we misled in certain ways? It, it just seems to me like we have this enormously valuable crutch out there. And to my knowledge, um, it's, it's entirely ignored. Um, and so so what, what I would say is, you know, you mentioned a little bit about um, uh, how Waysian themes, um, I, I don't, you know, it, it, that's encouraging that people are thinking that way, but it seems to me that, you know, maybe you can comment a little bit on to what extent has the, the, um, the knowledge about the evolution of the system been used or should be used to construct ontologies, at least at the level of mechanisms, but perhaps even at the level of the sort of higher level um, cognitive phenomena so that we have better definitions. I mean, this is a point that, you know, maybe I've, I've made too repeatedly, but, but I guess I, I just see it as a major source of insight that I think could be valuable. I think my concern, I, 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 so thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And, um, uh, and I am of, of course aware that people think evolutionarily and developmentally about how to differentiate kinds. Um, uh, the point that I'm trying, really there are two points that, that, that uh, I was trying to make. One is that that way of dividing up the kinds, looking back either into development or into history is going to answer a certain sort of explanatory questions. Where did these things come from? Um, uh, how, how were they, how, how did they change uh, over time? Um, uh, why do they have certain of the vestigial features that they do have? Um, uh, all of that seems really uh, very important. I, I think that the problems that I was trying to raise, raise for looking inside the brain um, uh, are going to be raised doubly or triply when it comes to thinking about evolution by natural selection. Um, that is, I tend to think of the his, I tend to think of natural selection. I'm, you know, I understand that Gould is no longer holding as much uh, force in in the field as he once did. But in many ways, I think of evolution by natural selection as uh, as, as an extremely messy war. But it's not the natural. It's not the natural selection. Sorry, it's not the natural selection that that I'm saying is being ignored. A lot of people care about natural selection clearly. What I'm saying, which is being involved is the descent with modification. In other words, the constraints that natural selection has in the kinds of things that it can construct, certain things just cannot be constructed. And I'm saying because of that, that tells us what the taxonomy, what the taxonomy is, where the joints are. In other words, rather than using it as an explanation for definitions that we build on the basis of human behavior, 
I think we should use that as an inspiration for what the definitions of the things are in the first place. And then later try to construct from those things, the things that look like human behavior. That's what I'm saying. It's not the natural selection. The natural selection, I agree with you. It's a mess and it's very hard to know uh, what conclusions we can draw from it. But the historical aspect of the gradual differentiation of, of, of larger systems into smaller systems, that is effectively the taxonomy. And I think both functionally and anatomically. That's what, I'm, that's what, that's what I, I'd like to... Just um, to use one really simple example, though, I mean, we could treat the... You know, if we think developmentally, we'll put the retina in the brain. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, but, 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 but if we're thinking about treating some kind of retinopathy, we might not want to treat the, the retina as part of the brain, but treat it as something that's distinct from the brain. Um, uh, and, and if we're interested in, you know, so for the, the point is really that, that of the first part of the talk is that expecting one, well, I, well, I completely respect the idea to look for causal boundaries, to, to look for interfaces, to look for causal independencies, wherever you can find them, and that those are going to be really useful clues as to what plays with what and what interacts from what. You know, much of my work is actually in developmental, is in neuropsychology, and there the entire game is about finding which cognitive capacities are causally independent of which other cognitive capacities. And, and that's what I'm really fundamentally interested in. And I think that these, you know, that this historical perspective adds another layer of uh, orientation to how I might discover that these two things are in fact really distinct. They have completely separate developmental pathways, for example, or they evolved differently in these different, in these different systems. And that, that all seems, that all seems like a really useful place to look for divisions in the causal structures of things. But really the point of the first part of the talk was to say that the effort to insist that your favorite way of carving up these boundaries is the one and true way of carving these boundaries just strikes me as going too far. That, that, that one might draw these boundaries on pharmacological grounds or historical uh, or evolutionary grounds or developmental grounds or, uh, and, and that, 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 you know, part of what we're learning in the philosophy of science, we're slow in this, Paul, but, but part of what's happening lately in the philosophy of science, I think, is a recognition that we often chunk the world in very different ways for different purposes and that those can be correct, that they can actually be mutually correct ways, that, that there might be a good way to look at the developmental system and that's right, but that that way of carving things up will not be the right way to approach it when you wanna understand how the adult organism is in fact functioning in the here and now. And, and all I'm, the first part of the talk is really just in line with people like Hasak Chang, I think just suggesting that there are different ways of organizing this material and, and that the drive for the one here um, might, might better be put on hold in favor of recognizing that we can get clues from all of these places that might be useful for different explanatory projects. Okay, I'll, I'll intervene and use my chair privilege to uh, put an end to this exchange because we all have only 20 minutes and a bunch of other questions. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, 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 I, I like to push back and I like the exchange. Uh, Philip, uh, oh, actually, Adina, Adina was already first, and then Philip. Adina, please go ahead, and then Philip, uh, your turn. Great. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I love the talk, and um, I guess I, I have a sense of what you might say, but I want to push a little bit. I mean, in the at least in the example of memory, you sort of made it sound like, well, once we've got sort of this handle on the empirical concept, we can do a mechanistic reduction. And of course, there are these problems about, you know, exactly what level you're interested in, but all of those are hierarchical reductions. And if you think more from, let's say, the neuroimaging standpoint, um, I think the worry in cognitive ontology isn't about what level of the hierarchy are you interested in, but you have you know, potentially these many cross-cutting ways of uh, identifying component parts. And, um, and even if you accept sort of a pluralistic view saying, look, there are different ways that you might carve up the pie depending on what your interests are, um, we don't 
want to go too nuts with it or it or, or doing these this kind of work sort of loses its guiding function and so the question is when do you know you're wrong right like what are the criteria for saying okay well this kind of potential interest is not fruit a fruitful one to look for mechanism yeah great thank you adina I mean, there, I think I just have, um, I'm gonna end up appealing to, I, I think it's a great, it's a great question. So it, it can't be that every, what I hate about pluralism, uh, honestly, I, I, I even hate putting the word in my talk um, uh, because it suggests a kind of- Anything goes. Um, too easy, anything goes, it's all just fine um, uh, sort of uh, attitude. And I really, I do not think that at all, um, and so uh, uh, um, what? What I what? But what I do want to say is, is okay. The, what would rule out an ontology is I think you know, when you find really thick causal dependencies between things, for, or that you can manipulate one thing by manipulating the other, and that they're they're uh, tightly in maybe even identical to one another or so if you're thinking about memory and imagining for for example and you recognize that um uh for the purposes of doing your experiments that all the same systems are lighting up when you do memory and imagination tasks i think that that's really telling you something that's telling you oh wait a minute these these two these two epistemic operations seem to involve the same cognitive components um, and 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 I think when you find that they don't overlap, and Kathleen McDermott, for example, um, who's a colleague of mine at Wash U, did these studies on, on episodic memory tasks and found that half of them produced one pattern of, of neural activation and half of them produced, you know, if you sit around and remember your past, that activates one set of systems. If you sit around and do list learning, that activates a different kind of systems. Both of these have been used to study episodic memory. Um, which one is the right one? Well, it turns out that probably for the purposes of this multi-level mechanistic story, those two things should now be separate um, because very different systems seem to be activated by them. And you can manipulate this one independently of that one. Right, so let me just push a little bit on that um, because in that explanation, you already are assuming you know what, the, what identifies the systems, right? And in something like neuroimaging, I mean, it's helpful if you get different patterns of activation, but you might have two different systems yielding the same pattern of activation because the resolution is not sufficient to identify individual systems. And so the problem isn't as easy uh, because you're, you know, you're already making assumptions about what constitutes a system and the and that you have access to the technological means of distinguishing those things, whereas the reality of the tools is that they don't they don't give you that yeah when i'm thinking in the empirical world i want a lot to be done by levels of i mean you're right um i i i, I, I yes <laughs> i'm <laughs> about to just say I, mean, I i i think that's right i think that that when we do um it, try to do empirical concept formation that what's left to us is to understand forms of causal dependence and independence and those, those kinds of causal dependence and independence can happen at the lower levels or they can happen at the higher levels. In neuropsychology, we study them by knocking one out and seeing whether the other one is preserved, right? Um, at the lower levels, we might find out that these neurons don't project to that area or that there's no connection between these two areas of the brain or that these two things are, are separate. So when you've got one of these overlapping cases, where you can't tell whether it's two mechanisms that have just happened to be localized, you know, uh, together in some area. Um, uh, how do you tell that? There, Max Coulthard, I think, has some, as you know, uh, <laughs> has some thoughts about how we might distinguish them by which, what causes manipulate which ones independently of other causes. Um, but I, look, a part of what I'm trying to do is to say that the cognitive ontology task is not is not easy. Um, and that even if we want to appeal to those kinds of causal structures, those causal structures might point in very different directions depending on how we carve the, the phenomena in the first place. So, yeah, thanks.
Edward. Yes, hello. Uh, thanks, Adina. Philippe, your turn. Hi, Carl. Thanks for the great talk. And um, of course, I'm very flattered of you including me in your talk. Uh, I think you overdid it a little bit with the German name. Uh, although Hawaii is with the W is an awesome name. I'm really sorry about that. I'm sorry about the W. Is, <laughs> not how vice but, is. But <laughs> no, no, the great thing is you're, you're continuing the great tradition of our family name being misspelled. So I think even my dad, when he was serving in the military, got his name misspelled. So, so you're in great company is, is all I'm saying. No, but it, I think, I, think I, I agreed with most of the two um, parts of your talk, but I'm interested to hear more on how they exactly fit together. And so um, let me go to this one point where you were invoking like the Hawaiian themes. Um, with the different perspectives on the brain, right? And you had you had like kind of this list of like developmental and metabolic and cognitive or or and so on. And it seems to me that those in your terminology of the second part would all be empirical perspectives on the brain, right? And they would necessarily by the phenomenon they're interested in carve carve the brain into different mechanisms. But it seems from what you're telling us in the second part is that the normative perspective is not on a par with all these other perspectives. And now that exactly raises a question of how in the end you wanted to still tell us that there is a way, I guess, to integrate the normative and the empirical. But I think really the linchpin question that we need to ask ourselves and that I think also Hawkland and uh, consequences we're asking is how, like, how are these norms uh, that we use when we are in the space of reasons beholden to the world as it is disclosed by natural science, right? So, so how do we um, adjudicate between our epistemic game of asking for reasons for remembering and so on and this normative and what we do know about the empirical phenomenon? And I think that I think the answer to that question will give us like the answer to how these two parts of your talk are related. So can you tell us a little more about that? I know it's a big question, but it's an interesting it, one too. It was, it's my inability, Philip, to answer this question that, that almost led me to abandon the talk this morning. Um, but let me, let me say something, um, which is, uh, you know, you could also ask like, how are the rules of chess beholden to the physics of chess pieces? And I would say not much, <laughs> um, uh, that, that in a way these things are, are definable independently with one another. But if we want a synoptic view um, that puts the space of reason somehow, you know, that allows us to view the space of reasons at the same time we view the space of causes and not have these two things interfere with one another. Um, and I think that's what, what we really want is not, is we want to be able to see them both without destructive interference. Um, that, that part of, you know, the simplest and most naturalistic way of answering that question, Philip, is that there's an awful lot in the epistemology that involves the acquisition of social norms and how we learn to remember, how we learn to make claims about remembering, where this concept came from. And here, Mar and Shibra, I think, are really onto something very important about the epistemic role that memory plays for us and that it's a kind of signaling when we make claims about remembering. And also the, the kind of work that developmentalists like Elaine Reese have been doing. You know, we learn to say, I remember this. You say like, mommy, remember when we went to the moon? You say, no, we can't go to the, we don't remember going to the moon because you can't go to, you'd never been to the moon or we weren't at the fair. So you couldn't have seen Micah at the fair because we weren't at the fair. And that that's a, that, that that's a way that we learn to use this vocabulary that is part of this social engagement that we've got with one another. So the most, and I, you know, I was told as a graduate student that there was no way to put these two worlds together. And in fact, it's my ambition to show that, that we don't have to give up on that. Um, that. That it's going to turn out that there's something correct about saying that episodic memory is not epistemic memory and that those two things should not be identified with one another because they're very different in kind. However, the, 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 the naturalistic 
task just becomes way more complicated and ornate and it goes through things like norm acquisition nor and you know like how we learn to talk about the self how we learn to talk about remembering how we learn to engage in that set of social practices and certainly brains are involved in all of that but it would be a mistake to think that just because we understand a spatial mapping mechanism and we think that that spatial mapping mechanism has been commandeered for the purposes of remembering and reconstructing events that we've somehow explained the significance of memory in the lives of persons, we haven't. Um, and, then, and then the thought is that that larger project involves seeing the brain as part of well, the, most natural, the most obvious naturalistic direction would be to go not inside the brain and down into smaller and smaller parts, but outside the organism into the social environments in which brains are trained up, in which we learn to be the kind of creatures that report on our past. And, and learn to hold one another accountable for the sorts of claims that we make about the past. And then the story about this epistemic level is not one that you find somehow etched in the developmental neural structure of things, but is something that is formed between, as an interplay between that neural structure and the social environments in which we grow. And, I, and if, I, if I were to, 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 to go in a naturalistic direction on this, and I'm totally inclined to do that, as you know, um, uh, that would be, I would go social. Cool. And can it, is there time for no, a little follow-up? I, no? I think we, okay. must, we will stop here um, because we still have some other questions. I'm sure you guys will have plenty of time to talk in the future. Um, Sorry about the name. I, yeah, I'll, I'll take the, uh, not, I would definitely abuse my power, not only by cutting Philip, but also by asking your question. <laughs> uh, uh, so I don't know. There must be some benefits, at least, in, in sharing all these sessions. <laughs> so, uh, so here, here's my question. So I, 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 I really like uh, the general idea of separating the what we could call the individuation criteria for episodic memory or for memory more broadly, depending on the domain of application. You know, and I think you're totally right that it's really too naive to think that we can just have a one-to-one -one mapping between memory as we use it in, at a personal level in our everyday interaction and as it is used in neuroscience. Um, and so I, I, I'm actually uh, really convinced by, by this idea. Um, as you rightly noticed, similar points have been made by Griffiths about emotions. There's a nice paper of Griffiths and Stoltz, I'm, sorry, I'm sure you know it. And Jim Woodward, back in the 1980s, wrote this paper, paper with Chris Hitchcock, also we are, where he also, um, about theory of mind, um, and arguing that beliefs and desires won't be eliminated. So, so um, um, and the perspective is a bit different, but I think if you find it congenial. My question, however, is that I, I'm a bit worried about uh, uh, what I saw was maybe a tendency, and maybe you'll correct me, to separate the normative and the empirical too strongly. And if you look in the history of, um, you know, how words are, are gets to be used, how notions get to be refined, changed, so there's always a very complex interaction between the normative and the empirical, right? As we learn facts about the world, the norms that govern the what, you know, uh, you know, the chess norms, one might think, uh, gets to be modified, right? So think, for example, about the law, right? You, the law is constantly modified in light of people's actual behavior. What we take to be right and wrong is updated when we just realize the majority of people do something that the law says is wrong. Uh, it's a very complicated set of interactions. Sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. Uh, and so I, I think you do, I think it's just not, and chess in that, in that case is a bit of a misleading example because chess is at, at a continuum where we just don't pay attention to what people do. We stick to the norms. But there are other cases where things don't do, are quite different from, from that one. So I think, I think there's something a bit more difficult here where somehow the kind of things we learn about the world might lead us to change a bit what we take to be, for example, memory, right? And we might change the way we think about it at a personal level. So I just wanted to ask you whether you, you're, where, maybe it's a gradient, right? Maybe it's a continuum from separation to really tightly interconnected to one another. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's also a really great uh, question. Um, uh, that, so if I understand what you're saying correctly, I mean, in a way it's related to a, a point that Patty Churchland might have made that, that our idea of remembering will be shaped in part by the empirical findings that we've got and, and that the norms have to bend to it. On, on the other hand, Edward, you know, I have been struck when I, 
you know, I go back and I read, I, I, I'm, I'm a terrible historian in some ways. I, when I go back and I read history, I, I often am reading in a very anachronistic way, I think. But, you know, I go back and I read Aristotle <laughs> on memory. And I think, oh my goodness, uh, Endel Talding borrowed his definition <laughs> from, from Aristotle. And then, and you know, and I hear Patty saying these things like, you know, this, uh, this way of talking about minds hasn't changed since ancient Greece and, and, uh, and, and for that reason has to go away. So, so in some respects, it does seem like some of our epistemic uses of remembering remain in place even if, even while we've allowed them to to change a bit, so I think you know I, my my colleague Alan Hazlett uh, writes a bit about um, whether memory is factive, and he claims that it's not, and and we've talked about this, and and you know there is an everyday sense of remembering. You say, well, I remember putting my keys on the desk, but they're not on the desk, and I must mm -hmm. not have. So I, and so there's a, there's a way of using this language that I think now builds in memory error to our talk. All I want to, what I want to do is um, just plant a nail in the fact that there is a continuing use that has this strongly normative sense that's, as, that's the kind of claim that one might make on a witness stand when you say, no, no, I remember seeing him take the amulet off the, off the, the felt um, and put it in his pocket, that, that you're, you're actually making, you're doing something assertoric. And I think that that functions so importantly in our culture for a variety of obvious ways and for organizing our lives. I mean, you know, what have I, you know, what did I already say? What haven't I said? Um, uh, you know, what, what am I doing? Where am I going? Where am I? Um, uh, those things all depend, I think, on a, on a relatively thick sense of epistemic remembering that has remained pretty consistent, even if we've now layered in subtleties around that notion. And I think that when, when you know, Sellers is interested in, under, not that Sellers was interested in memory in particular, but that like the kind of memory that would be space of reasons, memory proper is, um, is, is something that's very, that, has, that has, has, has legs, that's been around for a, a long time. So granted these things change, but, and, and I think I might even be willing, you know, Stitch pushed me at one point to recognize that, that and, and John Sutton uh, pushed me in this way as well, to recognize that in different cultures, the idea of remembering might in fact take very different forms. And that what, mm -hmm. you know, and that this idea of epistemic privilege might take very different forms. And I think that that goes back to what I was saying to, 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 to Philip, um, uh, that, that we're learning to play a game, um, an epistemic game when we get around in our social world. And, and you know, the rules of that game are very unclear and they are up for debate in a given culture. Um, but but that, that remembering can play a role, a role in one of those games without playing a role in the other game. And that these things can be somewhat insulated from one another. And I don't wanna make a strong claim that they're always and everywhere independent of one another or a strongly non-naturalist claiming, in fact, quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, having been trained there, um, uh, I was, I've been concerned that these two aspects of the human being are very difficult to put together. <laughs> and I'm aware of the fact that there are people who think that the space of causes is irrelevant to the space of reasons and people who think that the space of reasons is better jettisoned. And, and I just want to find a, <laughs> I don't want to give up on the naturalistic project Simply, but I want to acknowledge um, the kinds of things that people like Brandom and McDowell and, and Hoagland, I think, have been on about for some period of time as a really key feature of the way that minds are, uh, the way that we think about minds and how they work. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I, to be continued, but I, 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 I hear you. Uh, uh, so, Anne, you will have the last uh, question and then uh, we'll have to. Uh, We'll have to uh, to conclude this uh, talk as well as this lecture series. And the floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you. That was a was a really a, a brilliant go through of of, of your your position. Um, I my question is kind of simplistic, and I think you answered it. Which is if if the if the prop if one of the propositions is that uh, epistemic rem remembering is uh, you know to say it's not veridical is an oxymoron. Uh, 
you know, how do we account for the fact that people routinely remember inaccurately? Um, and not only routinely, I would say almost without exception, remember <laughs> inaccurately such that it kind of becomes the, the, the truth of it, the inaccuracy. Uh, doesn't that counter against uh, making a veridical claim? And thank you again, it was brilliant. And thank you, uh, Mashri, for this entire series. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, and and um, yeah, I'm I'm of course uh, you know as a as a as a late life student of Roddy Rodiger's, I'm like seriously aware of <laughs> um, the the frailty of human memory and uh, and how frequently even I get things wrong about my past, um, and so I want to acknowledge that um, the the idea it, 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 similar to the contemporary wor world, and I'm trying to hold on to an ideal in the face of uh, evidence that that ideal is often not lived up to. In the way that one might try in this day and age to keep, keep hold of an idea of rationality um, in the face of what appears to be widespread irrationality around you. And you say, well, the fact that many people, you know, it was never a surprise to anyone who talked about rationality that humans are in fact uh, far beneath the level of ideally rational, what we should do is articulate a norm of what rationality requires and then ask and, and then measure ourselves against that benchmark. And I think similarly about remembering, and, and, and this is just built into the science, this went by very quickly in my talk, it's, it, I think it's just built into the science of memory in some ways that, um, that, that we, we measure it against a success of accurate recording of the past. So if I put somebody through a memory test in a neurological exam, for example, I'm really looking at how many of the items they get right. Um, when I give somebody a word list and I ask them how many they remember, I'm tracking how many they get right and how many they get wrong. And that's an indicator of how well they're doing. So I don't think that the, so part of the point is that I recognize that humans are flawed um, in their memory capacities. And the memory is a deeply flawed system that often gets it wrong. But it's in virtue of having those systems that we are sometimes the kinds of creatures that get it right. And if we want to understand how our epistemology works, um, uh, the idea of getting it right plays a fundamental role there. So, so part of what I'm suggesting is that this way, this language that we've used for talking about people in the space of reasons is really kind of a way of keeping track of our reasons and our beliefs and our justifications and that kind of thing, and granting that we could be wrong about how we're doing all of that. Um, then, there's a, then there are these messy and earthy and worldly cognitive systems in virtue of which we approximate or sometimes come close to approximating those ideals. And that's how I would keep both of them, both of them in mind. You know, you can get a, you know, a 300 is a perfect school score in bowling. Very few of us actually achieve the 300. Um, uh, most of us hover around like 120 or so. That's where I am at least um, is around 120. Um, uh, but uh, but nonetheless, I'm bowling, and nonetheless, 300 is is the highest I can get. And uh, I'll keep the definition there because it acts as a benchmark. And, and that's, the way I'm, that's the way I'm thinking about this. And I don't know if I'm correctly articulating the way that um, uh, the sort of non-naturalist philosophy crowd would want to talk about these things, but I, I, I'm struggling to try to do so and, uh, and hopefully have, have come close. Wonderful, thank you very much. That's tremendously helpful. Thanks, Thank Carl, uh, for this really uh, wonderful talk and uh, amazing Q&A. Um, so I did not have to leave us because well, she didn't have to leave us. Her internet crashed down. She just called me. She has no internet whatsoever at home. <laughs> so uh, on, on her behalf, uh, I wanted to, uh, to thank you as well. Uh, and uh, on, I want also to thank everyone who's been attending this uh, seminar. I think it's been a very successful seminar series and we really enjoyed both Adina and I, all the talks we've heard and all the Q&As that have been happening following this talk. It's been a very lively uh, uh, discussion throughout the semester. So thank you uh, all the speakers, uh, all the keynote speakers, all the contributed papers. Thank you, Carl, for being the last uh, keynote speaker. It's been really, uh, I, I also think it's been a great way to conclude 
to conclude the series, in fact. Uh, so I really enjoyed, enjoyed having you uh, today. And uh, uh, you will find all the, um, um, all the videos of the talks, both on the Facebook Center's webpage, but also on the YouTube Center webpage. So if there's a, if there's a talk you missed and you want to uh, get back to it or you want to refresh your memory, they will all be accessible uh, uh, in uh, the future, and at least for the foreseeable uh, future. So thank you all, thank you, Carl, and uh, uh, have a all great holiday, actually. Uh, we'll uh, hope to see some of you next year and be safe, we we'll, uh, remain be safe, safe distance, mask and everything else. Bye guys. Bye. Thanks.